Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. Today, my special guest is my fellow librarian, Jenna, and we are diving into our fall vibes. So fall is my favorite season. Me too, and it's really gloomy outside today, so it's even better. It really is. The only bad thing is we were going to have our apple cider drink today. We were. We were, and we got stuck with pumpkin spice, which is also good, but... What happened Not to the really cider? They're, they're, they're uh, the Starbucks guy said that there's an apple juice shortage. I think he's a liar because we live in the state of apples. Yeah, I so. think you got fleeced. Yeah. yeah. Well. It's all right. Washington well, is the only greater apple producer than our state. Oh. Oh, know I know. That? And no. you know what? I, I'm going to stand on the hill and say that New York state apples are best. There you go. Really? I'll stand with you. I yes. grew up in the South and our apples were terrible. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, I think this we've talked about blessing. that. Yeah, this yeah. is a real blessing for yeah, me. Yeah, I have a friend in, from North Carolina trying to tell me her apples are good. And it's like, nope. mm, no, sorry. So, oh, well. <laughs> so besides apples, what else do you like about fall? Um, I like being able to wear a jacket, but like not need a coat. You know, a shacket, if you will. Mm-hmm. A shirt jacket. Um, I like pumpkins. I grow my own. I like the gourds with the warts on them. In fact, the wartier, the better. Oh, I like, I love weird pumpkins. Mm -hmm. I like different colors, different shapes, the knobs, the, yeah, yeah, I love it all. I like ghosties, some candles. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we were just saying we should have had a fall candle going. That would have been nice. Yeah. Yeah, I read something that, um, an article that was saying, like, why fall books are so popular, why people mood read in fall, and I thought this was such a great quote. Mm -hmm. It's subverting the sometimes disappointing world we live in (laughs) with a little magic. You know what? That applies to me (laughs) year-round. But, so Jenna and I are going to kind of delve into our mood reads. Both of us like to jump into the witchiness, I think. We do. And I will say there's been exponentially more witchy books published in the past two years. I've seen so many. I know. And series, too, which is kind of fun. So if you like one, hopefully there's a second or a third. Right. But I'm kind of liking that trend. So Yeah. So I'm going to jump into my first one, which is called The Unfortunate Side Effects of Heartbreak and Magic. And this cracked me up because so many of them are marketed now using this phrase, for the perfect blend of Gilmore Girls and Practical Magic. Oh, I I have a lot to say about this. I know. Well, the thing is, is I did not find this to be Gilmore Girls, maybe a little bit of Practical Magic. For me, it was more Hallmark movie and Practical Magic. Mm -hmm. Which is not equated to Gilmore Girls. No, no, not at all. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, it's fun. It's a fun, cozy read. Sure. Um, I think they're sucking people in under false pretenses. Yeah, any book that has a small town and is maybe set during the fall, automatically they said, go more girls. Yeah. But there's no quippiness, there's no banter. I mean, maybe some, but not nearly as much as I would assume. Right. So, but anyway... This one, it's, it is about Sadie Revelaine, and she comes from a long line of witches. She lives with her Gigi, which is her grandmother, in a small town where, of course, Sadie bakes magical treats. Of course she does. In her little cafe called A Peach in Time. Oh. So one morning going to work, she feels the winds of change, like literally there are winds coming down the street, yeah. and she knows that something wicked is brewing and of course, her ex boyfriend that she loved and he broke her heart is in town. So she's determined to keep her heart off limits, but she still likes sparks at the sight of him. Um, but when her grandmother announces that she has stage four cancer, Sadie feels like her whole world is tumbling down. So even though it's set in a, quir- a cute, quirky, magical town, Sadie, this is a lot of sacrifice, love, and family themes. Um, there's a lot of Revelaire family secrets, and Sadie has a twin brother named Seth that are going to be the key to the family's survival. Um, forgiveness is like a huge theme. There, oh, there is something really fun is there's recipes included at the end of every chapter. That's cool. Yeah, so that that's a really fun thing. But um, That would be a fun book club activity. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And 
the thing about her magic is each of their magic comes with a curse because it's said to keep them in balance. But her curse is that she will experience four major heartbreaks in her last in her life until she is so sad and bitter she will lose her magic. That's and a terrible curse. It is a horrible curse. And Sadie loves her magic. Like, I think her twin brother is like, mm, no part of it, you mm -hmm. know, but she, like, that is just integral to who she is. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It, it, it does end well. Um, it is a little bit irritating because they're going back and forth with that love affair when you know, of course. oh, stop saying you're not going to give your heart to him because we know darn well, Sadie, <laughs> that <laughs> Come on, you're going to head right towards this guy, <laughs> you know. And of course he's handsome, you know, the same they old things. Are. They're always, yeah. she's beautiful, he's handsome, you know, the witchiness, but it was fun. I really, yeah. I liked it. I would not say my main beef with it is I did not think it was Gilmore Girls. And that's everyone. Misleading. Yes. Everyone that did a review said that, you know, a lot of people said the same thing. What does like, that mean? Like a strong daughter mother relationship i think so but gilmore girls is such like a specific or i personally get such a specific feeling from it it's very comforting but it's clever yeah it's sharp you know um i don't know i know small town quirky characters um just friendly people i guess maybe a Lovable lot characters. and there were a lot of side characters too maybe yeah maybe that's what they you know. I don't know. But I think they try to use it because they know a lot of women really... Yeah, it's a tag. It's a tag. It's love like, that show. Right. So it'll suck you right in. Come on, girls. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your first one? My first one is called Small Town Big Magic. It's by Hazel Beck, which I thought was one person found out it's a it's a duo oh. of women. So that was interesting to me. I, I you know... I don't know that I've read a book that was written by two people at the same time. Christina Lauren is actually two people. No. Yes. <laughs> wow, I guess I have. Yeah. But it's funny because you think you'd be able to tell like a voice difference. You really can't. Mm -hmm. um, and I even tried to think back on it after I finished it and I couldn't find like any gaps. So great editing, I guess. Um, this is the f a duology. I think it might be a trilogy because... The second one ended on a cliffhanger, so I'm guessing there's probably a third coming out. Okay. Um, here's the thing. It is a four out of five in terms of witchiness. It's very witchy. Very heavy on the lore, on the world building, on spells and magic, and I liked that. I find sometimes that the witchy books are kind of mediocre witchy like oh they can stir a cup without having to use a spoon or something right. kind of half like that um this was very witchy and i loved that and i, I loved getting all of the the history of witches in general and their families so that was that was really good now it is about emerson she's probably i think she's in her late 20s she's on in this small town of um, Missouri, which I thought was fun, because oh. usually these witchy books are like New England, right? you know, yeah. Salem and all that. But this is in Missouri, like a river town, which was a nice little, nice little change of pace. Um, she's very loyal to her small town and is like super involved in the, in the town and the commerce. And her s lifelong rival is the mayor, Skip Simon. And they have constantly been fighting since she can remember. And she has this dream one night that he sends paranormal creatures to kill her. And it shocks her. And she wakes up and she's like, oh, I don't, what are para paranormal creatures? What is magic? What, I'm just this small, humble town of commerce lady that owns a bookstore and is really a girl boss, you know? Um, but little does she know, those paranormal creatures are real, and she is actually a witch, as well as all of her friends, and she's been mind wiped. Oh. Crazy. So she forgets all of her witch history, and all of a sudden, one day, she, she remembers it, and she has powers. So she really struggles with um, earning magic back and trying to remember who she was, um, and also getting to know her friends as different people. They were close people. And she just thought they were normal, but really they're witches. So she's having to get used to them as witches, which is fun. So she's new to her witch power. 
she's confused. She has to keep it quiet because she was mind wiped and the, the leaders of the coven can't find out. Um, and all of a sudden things start to change in the town and she and her friends are like in immediate danger and they have to save the town. But she's a bookstore owner? She's a bookstore owner. Oh, you had me at she's a bookstore owner. I know. She owns a bookstore and she runs the ch- the commerce of the town. She's the chair or something. And um, yeah, here's here's my main critique. It's not set in the fall. Oh, And okay. I thought it was. The cover of the book has these beautiful fall leaves, some candles, like a moon, stars. It's set in the spring. In the spring. Yeah. And they don't mention it until halfway through the book. So I spent half of the book picturing this beautiful fall town. Right. When really it's in the spring. And then halfway through they get very like descriptive about trees and flowers and stuff. And it really took me out of the... Took you right out, out of, of the, the story. Yeah. yeah. Does the story end in fall? No. It ends on the first day of spring. Hmm. I'd be disappointed. I was. So I took it down a star. It's okay. three out of five for me. How dare they? I know. Yeah, normally it, it isn't just in this in the fall, but there's usually a big fall yes, celebration pumpkins. in these books. Yeah, harvest festivals. Yes, a harvest festival yeah. or a you know, some kind of ghost dance or I don't know, something. Ghost dance. None of that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, my second one, I'm going to turn a little bit from the witchiness and dive into more of my November mood. Which, mm. November, Claire is <laughs> melancholy. She's playing Alison Krauss, like, pretty much full time, <laughs> you know, full stop. Into my kind of ballad, you know, bluegrass. Yeah, okay. That's just my vibe for November. Because okay. as we know, up here in western New York, it's gray. Mm-hmm. It's gray every day. This seemed like a very November day, like, outside to me today. It, yeah. So, um, but, and and this is another one of my kind of favorite southern authors he's this um lives in north carolina and my book is called the caretaker by ron rash and it's set in north carolina in the 1950s in the town of blowing rock have you ever been to blowing rock i have yeah me too Mm -hmm. so so right away i can kind of picture the town and normally friendship is a strong spotlight in his novels family dynamics, and the family dynamics are not always great. So particularly how parents treat their children and why. Um, Characters are sorely tested, and not all of them will do themselves proud. So in this novel, there are three main characters, Gant Blackburn, Jacob Hampton, and then Jacob's wife, Naomi. So Gant is the, you meet him, he's 16 years old, He was struck with polio at a young age, so his face is kind of disfigured and his leg. Is this modern? It's in the 1950s. Okay. Yeah. So um, his parents are moving to Florida, but Gant really wants to stay in hometown, so he's offered a job as the caretaker of the local cemetery by... Right. So a little spooky, but there are no, like, ghosts or anything. No haunts, yeah. No haunts, just that atmosphere. Um, he's the target of bullies, but he's he's a good guy. He's big, he's solid, he's rugged. A lot of people are kind of afraid of him, the way he looks, but that's really not his fault. He takes a lot of pride in, you know, taking care of the cemetery and caring for people that don't have people come for them. And, you know, so I liked, I liked Gant a lot. And um, he also doesn't, you know, put up with vandals or anything else. Jacob, on the other hand, is from like the wealthy family in town. His parents own the store and they are, they've already lost two children. Like they lost two daughters early in their lives. So they have adored Jacob, but really want to control like Mm. his entire path of life. Cause now everything is on Jacob and they want Jacob to inherit the store and they want Jacob to marry the most beautiful girl in town whose family owns a business that would, you know, behoove the both Mm -hmm. of them to merge. So, and Jacob is having none of this. He really is not interested in this. They're trying to push him to go to college. He really doesn't want to. He wants to work with his hands. So he gets a job at his father's mill. And literally the foreman is is like giving him the most horrible jobs and everything. And he actually really thrives and likes it and gets promoted to like 
foreman or whatever. But anyway, he meets Naomi, who hmm. is from Tennessee, and she is a maid in town at the hotel. Her father, like she's sending home money to her father to help with the farm. She is not educated. She's beautiful, but she is not who Jacob's parents Oh, want him to marry. Wrong side of the tracks. Right. Jacob doesn't care. Hmm. Jacob marries her anyway. <laughs> he elopes. So his parents disinherit. You know, they they cut him out. Oh, boy. Yeah. So they, they buy a little house. They fix it up. But anyway, since Jacob didn't go to college, he's now drafted for Korea. Oh. So the book opens, and he is a night watchman in Korea. It's cold. And he knows that there have been people coming, like crawling over the lines or whatever, over this frozen river to get into their encampment. And sure enough, here comes somebody, and he's like this old night watchman. So he gets badly injured, um, ends up being sent home, and his mom has hatched this plan to get rid of his yeah. wife. Oh. I don't really want to go into what the plan was or what happens. Yeah, sure. Because once you get to that part of the book, and this is a very short book. It's like under 300 pages. Oh, and by the way, the wife is pregnant. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. So, so Jacob is expecting his first okay. child. Yeah. And his the letters from his wife, and meanwhile, she's taking courses to get her, like, GED or whatever. Like, she's trying to better herself. Good. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. So you have this plot to, okay. to uh, you know, and when you see the lengths of which his parents will go to stop this from happening, it's pretty despicable. Oh, no. But our friend, the caretaker. I was going to ask where he comes into oh, play. Oh, he comes into play because once they're disinherited and Naomi is pregnant, Jacob asks him to watch over his wife. Oh, that's You know, sweet. to make sure she's safe, make sure she's okay. So... And he, he does. A caretaker in many ways. Yes. Mm. Yep. So. That sounds beautiful. It was. I thought it was very good. I liked it. Good. It also has a beautiful cover. Oh, it does. The artwork Beautiful is fall cover. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Here's my second book. It's called A River Enchanted. It's also a series. It's a duology. There will be no third. It's just two. Um, it's by Rebecca Ross, who you might remember wrote like the sensational Divine Rivals book. Mm -hmm. Divine Rivals is a YA book, and I liked it. Um, a River Enchanted is Rebecca Ross's first adult fiction book. So y I will say there is some crossover. You can kind of see her YA tendencies, but much less YA than Divine Rivals was. And I that appealed to me a little bit more. Um, now, this is not witchy spooky. It is more of... Um, magic and spirits mm -hmm. um not necessarily witches um however i will say this did this is glowing praise it got me out of my um fourth wing hangover <laughs> because that book was so good that i didn't want to read anything else and this was the, the book i picked up afterwards maybe like three weeks after i read fourth wing and it did get me out of that book hangover which is a feat, let me tell you. Yeah, oh, I can I can speak to that. It's a feat. When yeah. I read Fourth Wing, it's all I thought about. And maybe I'll talk about it in our best books of 2023. That's right. We can both talk about it. Um, but this, I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this book, too. So it was good and, and different than Fourth Wing, which was nice. Um, so here it is based in scotland like this mystical scottish island okay and i, I actually listened to this on audiobook um up until the point where it, i was so intrigued i had to read quicker instead of listening to it um because the, the narrator was too slow and i had to like read really quickly through the pages um but the narrator had a wonderful scottish accent which was oh that sounds it really great. put me into the atmosphere mm -hmm. um so i did think about this book a lot and the reason for that is the world building. It's because it's a mystical Scottish island, of course, they go into real depths of explaining what the island looks like, what the people are wearing, of course, a lot of plaid, lot, what the nature is like, lots of grass and fog and rocks and cliffs and oceans and things like that. So the main character is Jack Tamerlane. He's probably, I don't know, in his 30s, and he's just returning back home to this island after studying music on the mainland. Now, it doesn't say, like, when this is taking place. I'm assuming 
much, much older times. It's mm-hmm. not very modern at all, but of course it's like a magical island, so time doesn't necessarily matter. But he's studying music at university to, and mostly the harp. He's kind of learned how to be a bard, if you will. That's what he calls himself. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's a bard. Um, so he is on his way home, and he on the boat to his island, he hears from the guide piloting the boat. <laughs> Can't think of the right word. Sailing. Sailing the boat. Um, that little girls, like eight-year-old girls, are going missing on the island. Uh-oh. And as you know, with Scottish families and their clans that's really tight um and so immediately he's worried he's like oh something is afoot um so he gets home and he finds his mother and he says i've been summoned by the laird of the east clan of the island there's an east and west of course they're their rivals um and he goes to see the laird and the laird says oh no i didn't summon you and jack says well if you didn't summon me who did And it's the Laird's daughter, Adara, who um, wrote him a letter and forged her father's signature to get him to come home and play music for the spirits because she thinks it will help find the missing girls. Oh. Um, So they, of course, are lifelong rivals. Of course. She's part of the reason he left the island. Oh. oh. Um, So they're childhood enemies, um, but she knows that the only way to get the spirits to listen to them is to play music for them. So she hopes Jack can kind of bring them forward with his music um, and have them. She thinks the spirits have taken the girls. So that's her her problem solving here. Um, But with each passing song that Jack plays for the spirits, it becomes pretty apparent that this trouble with the spirits is much more sinister than just the girls going missing. Um, So there's nice rivalry between the East and the West sides, and they're trying to work together and figure out why these girls are going missing. The world building is amazing. It's just a really good, really good book. Have you read the second one in the... I have. Okay. And it was equally as good. Okay. Um, you know, the, the first book, go, it solves the mis- the current mystery, so you're not left on a super cliffhanger. Um, there is, of course, a cliffhanger in its own regards, but not the major mystery of the story. Um, and then the second one is, is just as good, the same characters, um, which is nice. I don't like it when they switch main characters. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I have that one on my shelf at home, so I want to read that one. It's a really lyrical feeling. Yeah. So I'm going to finish up with my last one, which also, this is the one that got me out of my fourth wing hangover. Really? It was called The Unmaking of June Farrow by Ooh. Adrian Young. This one has a lot of similarities to the one you just talked about, because Adrian Young is also, she started out as a young adult author. She wrote mm-hmm. the book Fable. Um, I've heard of that. Yeah, I'm trying to think of another one, but this is not her first adult novel it's her second adult novel and i read the first one i think the first one was called spells for forgetting you've recommended this to me before yeah and that was that was good but i actually liked this one a little better okay so here's the setup for this one once again we're in the mountains of north carolina um (laughs) a trend yes it's definitely a clear trend But it's the town of Jasper, and the Faro women are known for, they have a a thriving flower farm. And this farm is kind of magic, and they have beautiful blooms that you can't really find in that part of the country. But they also have created a presence and a demand for, like, people that want to get married from all over want flowers from this farm. Mm -hmm. Um, But unfortunately, along with this gift of flowers, the women in the family have a curse that has plagued their family line. So the whole town remembers the madness that led to Susanna Farrow's disappearance, leaving June, who was our main protagonist, to be raised by her grandmother and haunted by rumors of her mother, who supposedly went mad. Um, June, though, has started hearing things now and like wind chimes and maybe a voice that's not there and on different occasions she's seen like this door pop up like out in a meadow you know like a red door i'm so intrigued (laughs) yes um so june is beginning to think that maybe that is starting to affect her Mm -hmm. and she's determined that this curse 
will go no further. Like she doesn't want to fall in love. She doesn't want to have children because she's kind of terrified as to what she's going to bring. But um, her grandmother, who is now in a home and looks like possibly having signs of Alzheimer's, passes away. But after she passes away, June receives a letter from her containing a picture of a woman that looks like June's mother with a minister from the town that was much, much further back than when her mother was alive. So now Ooh. she's really starting to wonder, like, what is going on? Why does this picture that looked like my mother um, with this man who was like a prominent person in the town who was murdered, by the way? Um, so she starts digging into the past and she thinks like the next time she sees one of these doors pops up, she's going through it. So, of course she does. So, time travel, a mystery, a small town, North Carolina. What's not to love, you know? No, everything's good. Yeah. Um, and a little a little witchiness to boot. But mostly with this one, it's, it's not so much like witches and spells. It's more this whole time travel thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what life is she going to end up choosing? Because, of course, you know, she goes back and, and there's something out there that's waiting for her as well. So, um, yeah, I really like this one. I'm going to see if this is on the shelf as soon as we finish this. Yeah. No, it was really good. Yeah. So The Unmaking of June Farrow. It might have just, like, come out today, actually. <gasps> did you read the arc? That's sneaky. I did. I did. So I've been, like, sitting on this waiting to <gasps> talk about it. I know. I'm surprised you haven't mentioned it before. But yeah. I like this because it's a surprise for yes. me. Yes. To... Yeah. All awesome. right. So what's your last one? Okay. My last one is a fun one. And it's it's um, it's a rom com, if you will, um, with a little bit of uh, ghosties. Oh, we got some ghosts. Um, this is called "The Dead Romantics" by Ashley Poston. Have you read it before? I have not read this one, but you recommended her other one to it me. Did. The and Seven I, Year Slip. The Seven yeah. Year Slip. I really liked that one too. Really good. Similar. Um, similar type of main characters, actually. That strong woman type of character. So this is about Florence Day. She's a ghost writer for a very famous romance author. So she writes these novels as a ghost writer. Um, uh, she has a problem though. She has currently gone through a terrible breakup and she cannot write the romantic ending to the book she's working on. So she is way past her deadline. The Of course, the author that she's ghost writing for is old with Alzheimer's, which is why she is the ghostwriter, so the author cannot help her. It's just her alone in her apartment, eating ice cream by the pint, depressed, can't finish this. And it's actually pretty comical because she does try a couple of times and each one like gets progressively worse. Like the main character punches the guy in the head or like he falls off of a cliff and like so she's trying to write it but it just not is not coming out right. So um in this process, like I said, she's way late on her deadline. Um, she gets a new editor, and he requests to meet with her. Now, as you can probably guess, he's very handsome and is the main love interest of this story. But um, when he meets her, he refuses to give her an extension on her book. So she has one week to finish it. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. So she's ready to like just wrap it up and be like, I'm, a, I'm done. And she can't tell him she's a ghostwriter. She just is known as the secretary to this author because no one wants to know the author is Alzheimer's. And so lots of hijinks there. Um, but in this, the same day, she gets a phone call that her father's passed away. Oh, no. I know. It's sad. So she returns back home. And you get lots of her backstory to fill in on her troubling breakup. Um, and you get to learn about why they broke up. So I won't go into the specifics, but some important information is that she was raised in a funeral parlor. Her dad was a mortician. Um, and of course, it was this big, spooky home. Um, so this is where the ghosties come in. Um, her dad was a mortician, and the dead bodies would be in the basement and, you know, the morgue and she as a girl growing up would see ghosts every time a new body would come in they would appear to her as a ghost with their unfinished business and she would help them oh my gosh okay so she can see ghosts not only she is a ghost writer she can see ghosts it's that, a play on words that's that's fun so she now is home for her dad's funeral she hasn't seen a ghost in a long time 
And all of a sudden, a knock on the door comes, and she opens it, and it's her editor. He's a ghost, and he has unfinished business that he needs to solve. Oh, And no. the unfinished business is her book. So now she's stuck with this ghost of the editor man that she does not like, a book that she cannot finish, and her father has passed away. So she's going through a lot. That does sound very heavy. I will tell you it's pretty funny. They do like mix in a lot of humor, and it's kind of like maybe the sense of humor isn't for everyone. It's for me. It's pretty dry, um, sarcastic, and it does actually deal with grief very beautifully. It's mm-hmm. like a pretty heavy topic in the book. Um, so, you know, she now has her ghost editor. They they go through all this together, and it's it's really good. Okay. It's I'm really definitely going to have to add that one to my list. Yeah. I read it in, like, July, August, and I wish I saved it to read now because yeah. it's not necessarily set in the fall, but just something about having, um, you know, dealing with death and, like, a like a lighthearted way, mm-hmm. almost a comforting way, and also ghosts and, you know, there's lots of mortician talk crows you know like that type of thing um was it was really enjoyable and i wish i could have read it in october and not july yeah i'm wondering about that author because grief was a big part in the seven year slip i was just gonna say that grief is a big part in the seven year slip and that deals with time travel too so it's a little enchanting in a way right um but yes Hmm. yeah a lot to think about yeah well we're definitely swapping books again yeah we should we should we always do but all right well hopefully some of the books that we have talked about today sometimes i forget there's people out there yeah, i know we get really into <laughs> it yeah so we'll we'll appeal to you so thank you for joining us for another book break be sure to either leave us a review or send us an email with your thoughts to let us know if there are suggestions for future episodes or themes mm-hmm. um and just to let you guys know i always have all the links to the books that we talk about nice. in our show notes so i have where you can find them in the library if there's an audiobook like where you can listen to it and also if you want to purchase it i include a link to bookshop which i think will take you to your you know hopefully give you some business to your local yeah that's local good bookstore. i will say listen to all three of these on hoopla for free i know hoopla can be they also have some really great audio they do so i also like a good hoopla audiobook so thanks so much for joining us and we will see you next time mm-hmm. bye-bye Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Grease Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.